That's right. <laughs> I didn't recognize your hairstyle, sorry. Oh, my hairstyle. And if it was, remember Don Coffey? Yes.
Went to the, I mean, they did the bathroom. The went to the Thank <laughs> you. 
Ask those of you with ribbons only to please stand. And before we begin, um, there's a custom called And in Jewish tradition, when we have a loss, we tear. And there's so many reasons we do this. I'm going to give you three. One is for physical gains. And when we have a loss, we have a need to do something physical. Tearing changes nothing. It's not cathartic, but it feels like the right thing to do. <laughs> Secondly, it's a tear in the fabric of your family. So we tear. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, and I say this to you in particular, Diane, at the moment we tear, your job, your job is to. Okay. Oh, he's oh, 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 I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay. Up until this moment, your job has been taking care of details. Now your job is to let us take care of you. And so for hearts that are torn, we perform this act of Kriya, this act of tearing. I'm going to ask those of you with ribbons only to repeat after me, please. Adonai Natan. Adonai Lakach. Adonai Lakach. Yehi. Shem. Adonai. Levorah. God has given. God has given. God has given. God has taken away. God has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. Blessed be the name of God. Baruch Ata Adonai. Dayan. Dayan. Emet. Emet. We praise you, Adonai. We praise you, Adonai. Truthful judge. And let us all say Amen. Amen. I ask you to tear the ribbon from the bottom. It's pre-cut, so don't tear it too hard. Traditionally, you wear it for seven days. Just tear the bottom. Mm -hmm. And you may be seated. Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to this funeral service for our beloved Jack Zellinger. Those who are here in person, those who are watching virtually, we come in our grief. We come to offer support to this amazing family. And we begin with the 16th Psalm. Shiviti Adonai Lenegdi Tami Kimimini Baal Emot Lachen Samach Libi 
ויגל כבוד יף בשרי, ישכון לבטח. כי לא תעזוב נפשי לשאול, לא תיתן חסידך לראות שחת, תודיעני אורח חיים, סוב השמחות את פניך, נעימות בימינך הנצח. I have set the eternal always before me. God is at my side, I shall not be moved. Therefore does my heart exult and my soul rejoice, my being is secure. For you, O God, will not abandon me to death, nor let your faithful ones see destruction. You show me the path of life. Your presence brings fullness of joy. Enduring happiness is your gift. Death has taken our beloved Jack Zellinger. And our friends grieve in their darkened world. In their silence, there is lamentation. In their tears, there is loneliness. Lost in their sorrow, may they find the presence of loving friends. Hear them, O oh God, and be with them. For Jack's love. That, about, that united us in life and which death cannot sever. For his companionship that we shared along life's path and which continues through the tenderness of memory. For his vision, for his friendship, for his laughter, for the gifts of his heart and mind that brought joy and happiness and is now a precious remembrance for all these and more. We give our thanks to God. And in this time of grief, we listen to the voice of our sacred scripture that brings us the ever new message of God's nearness that tells of our kinship with the creator. In light as in darkness, in joy as in sorrow, in life as in death. I often will read the 15th Psalm at a funeral, but there are times when the text appears to have been written specifically for the deceased. God who may abide in your house, who may dwell in your holy mountain. Those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth within their hearts, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who scorn the lawless, but honor those who revere God, who give their word and come what may do not retract, who do not exploit others, who never take bribes. Those who live in this way shall never be shaken. Sure words were never written about Zach, Jack Dellinger. And the 23rd Psalm that has brought so much comfort to so many over the ages. I'll chant it in Hebrew and then ask that you join with me in the English. Those of you who received a packet should have the words printed. If not, you probably know bits and pieces of it and recite it with me in the English. Adonai roi loho echsar, bin od deshe yarbitseni al me menu hot yena haleni, nafshi yeshove, yahan heni, bema agle tsedek leman shemo, gam kielech begate salmavet, lo irara, kiata imadi. God is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes me lie down in green pastures. 
leads me beside still waters and restores my soul. You lead me in right paths for the sake of your name. Even when I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You have set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of God forever. Just a few moments ago, when the family tore that ribbon, performed the mitzvah of Kriya, we recited these words of Job. Adonai natan vadonai lakach Hishem adonai mevorach. God has given, God has taken away. Blessed be the name of God. In ancient people, we are well acquainted with grief in the valley of shadows. Death and sorrow are not strangers to us. And yet the centuries have taught us that the Keter Shem Tov, the crown of a good name, endures beyond the grave. And that there is strength in faith. And so with Job, we say, Adonai Natan, God, you have given. You gave us Jack Zellinger, who will not be forgotten. And for all that was good and enduring in Jack's life, we offer the deepest thanks of our hearts. Adonai Lakach, and God, you have taken away. We pray for the strength to turn our broken hearts into an altar of trust before which we acknowledge your sovereignty and love as we now say, Yishem Adonai Mevorach, Me'atavi Adolam, blessed be the name of God now and forever. And finally, the words of Ecclesiastes, that as we enter into a new year, we read with poignancy, for everything, there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to tear down, a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to throw stones, a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to discard, a time for tearing, a time for sowing, a time for silence, and a time for speaking. And now is both a time for silence and a time for speaking, a time to hold on to memories, to long friendships that go back decades. A time to remember a mentor, a teacher, a dear friend, partner, father, grandfather, brother, uncle. And that was also a time to speak, to share words of tribute. And so we're going to take a few moments now of silent prayer as we remember Jack. Followed by eulogy, we, we pray now in silence. Im reithi vehegyon libi Lefanecha Adonai Suri vegoali May the words of our mouths And the meditations of our hearts Be acceptable in your sight Be acceptable in your sight 
God, our rock, our rock and our redeemer. God, our rock and redeemer. Amen. This time, I want to call on Jack's beloved son and best friend, Steve, to share some words that will be followed by a tribute from his grandchildren. And then Rabbi Foster and I will speak. Steve. My sisters and I are so proud of our father, Jack Zellinger, a.k.a. Jackie, his given name, believe it or not, or Yankel, as his father and sometimes our mother called him. Like so many of you here today, our dad was the embodiment of the American dream. The self-made son, the self-made son of an immigrant, self-reliant, as humble as he was confident, he was deeply appreciative of America, its bounty, and the refuge it provided his family. Our dad was the most centered person we have known. His decency and his humility often obscured his talent and his success. Slow to anger, quick to forgive. I recall him becoming furious only when his integrity or his identity was challenged. Our gentle and sweet father was not a violent man yet. He didn't hesitate to protect those unable to defend themselves. When a Jew hating neighbor threatened six-year-old me with physical harm, when bullies repeatedly roughed up his gay high school buddy at a time before sexual orientation was discussed or respected, and when the welfare, health, and future of his daughters or his wife were at risk. Everyone was welcome at his table. Our dad, dad, our dad was most remarkable for his ability and willingness to let each and every person with whom he shared even a moment simply to be which is not to say he was a moral relativist or didn't have just a dose of larceny in his veins. <laughs> Our dad was authentic and he pulled no punches. A man of strong opinions and conviction, dad was more likely to make you feel welcome and comfortable than to hold court. We cannot talk about our dad without talking about his great love affair with, my, with our mother, his beloved Diane. Dad would and did, well, would do anything, anything legal that is, to make his Diane happy. Our mom and dad were passionate. They loved passionately and they fought passionately. Theirs is a romance for the ages, imperfect in its humanity, perfect in its inspiration for us all. Jackie was a true and good father to my sisters and me. And like a father to so many he held dear, Joey, Doug, and a blessed memory, his sweet niece, Sydney, and his first and adored grandchild, Jason. 
with whom our dad is undoubtedly now steaming some celestial 1031. <laughs> this should not be a sad day that a good and fine and beautiful man lived 86 years and not 87. We rejoice in his achievements, honor his legacy, feel his love, and strive to stand in the shoes of our Jackie, who demanded so little and gave so much. Baruch Dayan Ha'emet. I want to call the grandchildren forward, please, who are speaking. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today to honor. Thank you so much for being here today to honor the life of Jack Zellinger. For those of you who don't know us, we are Jack and Diane's grandchildren, and we wrote this eulogy together. Jack Zellinger had many names. To his wife, Diane, or Bubby, he was Jack or Jackie. To his children, Steve, Elise, and Michelle, he was dad. To many of you, he was brother, uncle, cousin, business partner, advisor, jokester, confidant, and loyal friend. And to us, he was Zadie, our mentor, our inspiration, and our friend. Zadie was our trusted advisor, honest and straightforward. Zadie could transform life's difficult decisions into straightforward questions and plans of action. Whether it was advice to pursue college, move in with a significant other, or financial decisions, Zadie stood ready to help us make sense of seemingly an extremely complex world and build up our confidence in the process. That being said, Zadie never pulled his punches. He would offer tough words, much needed advice when we needed to hear them the most. At one point or another, every single one of us received some, some form of Zadie tough love. And in my case, form of his timeless call to duty that I should just be a mensch. This was especially true for my brother, Jason. Zadie and Jason had a very special bond. He was the head of our, Zadie was the head of our table, the rock of our family. And as the first grandchild, Jason aspired to serve that role. Zadie took Jason under his wing while Jason was in business school, supporting him, helping him pursue a career in commercial real estate. Together they thrived. Jason went on to love his career because Zadie, took so much pride in his grandchildren. I have no doubt that my brother was there standing at the gates, waiting for Zadie, most likely with a deck of cards and a prospectus. Zadie's advice extended beyond business to all aspects of our lives. Advice on how to be a better son, how to be a better sibling, how to be a better spouse, how to be a better father. We all stand up here with different passions and dreams. And Zadie's advice was never one size fits all. Zadie allowed each of us the grace and space to pursue our own goals and our own dreams. He listened intently and made an effort to learn what drove us so he could tailor guidance and support accordingly. Zadie was our most trusted advisor for a reason, because he was the best. Our Zadie was a lover, but beyond that, 
He was a true family man. When, rem when reminiscing on stories of our Zadie together, each of us recounted Zadie's embraces, his playful nature, sweet pinches, and warm smile. We have countless stories of Zadie's love and support. The closeness we share as a family is a reflection of the standard Zadie set. He was always the loving, caring, and supportive giant of a grandfather. From seeing Cowboy Joe in the car and watching Disney movies, our conversation became more in depth and complex to include our career and life aspirations, religion, economics, philosophy. As each of us became adults, it really felt like Zadie was getting to know us for who we were to become. His love knew no bounds, insisting family first and family always. We need not to look any further than his devotion to his wife. Zadie modeled for us what it meant to be a true partner in his 64 relationship with our Bubby. His passionate love and commitment for her never wavered. Through life's hardest moments, Zadie and Bubby leaned on each other, leaned on this loving foundation and grew it together. As Zadie's grandchildren, we aspire to, de to aspire to develop that type of love and devotion for one another that we have seen to shared. That love and devotion they developed and passed down from generation to generation. This love also extended well beyond our immediate family. Through good times and bad, Zadie showed us selflessness, generosity, inclusivity to all he came in contact with. Zadie brought levity and laughter to hard times and was always sought the best in and brought out the best in people. He was a man of deep-seated humility who could get along with anyone and never lost his compassion for others. From Zadie, we will forever take his lessons in devotion, love, and kindness. But perhaps more than all these things, Zadie was simply an incredible friend. A call away at all times, Zadie would drop everything to listen wholeheartedly to the happenings of our lives and fill us in on his too. Sometimes we would discuss the trivial, like the latest Netflix series he was binging. He loved thrillers. We would laugh together over his notorious chain emails and YouTube videos, or discuss the most recent escapades of his Romeo club in Arizona. That's short for retired old men eating out. <laughs> Other times, our conversations would delve deeper. Zadie was intensely, but not overwhelmingly curious about the latest in our love and professional lives. Were things just a fling, or are they actually getting more serious? He always wanted to know if we were liking what we do and if our employers were treating us well. If life got us down, if we ever expressed the slightest doubt, Zadie was there, as a good friend always is, to help us dust ourselves off, get back in the saddle, and inevitably leave us laughing hysterically. In return for his selfless friendship, Zadie asked only one small thing of us, lots and lots of ice cream. <laughs> Whether hiding in the closet for a quickie ice cream sandwich or searching for the best milkshake in town, Zadie knew that life always tasted better with a little bit of sweetness even on his no salt or Atkins diets. He was a grandfather, a great grandfather, and an even greater friend. Just one week ago, a world without Zadie was unimaginable. Today, as we confront the tears and the pain of his absence, we know that Zadie's memory will be with us forever. May his memory be a sweet blessing. Dear Diane, 
dear Steve, dear Elise and Ron and Michelle and dear Jerry and Eve and Aaron and Camille and David and Tara and Madeline, dear Danielle and Chris and Janelle and Dominic, dear family and friends all. This morning I was teaching a class to our teachers in our religious school and we looked at the following text. It's from Pirkei Avot, chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Ezehu chacham halomed mikol adam. Ezehu ashir hasamech bechelko. Ezehu mechubar hamechabed et habriot. Who is wise? The one who learns from everyone. Who is rich? The one who's satisfied with what he has. Who is honored? The one who honors everyone. And as I taught this text, I couldn't help thinking about Jack. In so many ways, he embodied Rabbi Ben Zoma's words. He was a man of integrity, whose word was his bond. He was loyal and loving. He loved to laugh and he did it well. He was meticulous about everything from the clothes he wore to the way the pillows were arranged on his bed. Right, Diane? He was honest, some might even say to a fault. He was a lifelong learner who had a great respect for teachers, rabbis, entrepreneurs, and inventors. He was an athlete and a sports fanatic whose vision and ability to bring people together brought professional basketball to Denver when he and his lifelong friends and partners and poker buddies helped to create the Nuggets and to ensure that the move from the ABA to the NBA was successful. He was a humble man who, despite his great successes in life, had no patience for bragging or name dropping, but rather his greatest joys in life came from his family, especially the love of his life, his Diane. Jack was born on New Year's Day, 1935, and Steve, as you wrote so beautifully in your obituary, the first Jewish baby born in Denver that year for which his parents were awarded diapers and tap dancing lessons. His parents, Henry and Ida, raised Jack and his two sisters, Shirley and Jerry, in a home that celebrated faith, family, patriotism, and hard work. His father immigrated when he was 14 years old from Silesia in Germany in 1915, escaping the Tsarist army. And his mother Ida was orphaned and grew up here in Denver. And Jack and his father were best friends. And when Henry died, Steve, you took on that mantle. Jack's father, Henry, had a deep and abiding love for his adopted country, and he worked very hard to bring his entire family over from Germany. Everyone lived in his house. And he worked with then Governor Johnson and Alderman Harry Zinn. He paid to get them here and he had to give them a job. And those were the values that he inherited. And as the eldest and the only boy and the first to be born in America, Jack was the prince of the Zellinger family. He had a very special relationship with his Bubby Kleiman. And they adored each other. And he grew up learning and living the value of hard work. He started working when he was eight years old, selling peanuts at the ballpark. And he learned from a young age not to ask for anything unless you absolutely needed it. He never went to camp. He never had vacations. He bought his own car. He never took anything. And he taught his children to share in his worth ethic as well. As we've heard, he loved America. And he had a soft spot for immigrants and refugees. He partnered with brilliant immigrants from, the Is from Israel, from the former FSU. He was always in awe of inventors and entrepreneurs and he forged many wonderful partnerships over the years where he combined his business smarts with their creativity. Wonderful story of how Eli Polanski invented a tool. They went to China together to market, packture and man package and manufacture it. And Jack told Ellie to keep his mouth shut because he had a potty mouth. <laughs> and many of the habits that Jack learned as a child stayed with him throughout his life. But two in particular come to mind, fishing and of course, ice cream. 
As a child, Jack learned to love to fish at Sloan's Lake, especially when he could be there with his beloved sisters. He loved ice cream as a child, and he was a bottomless pit throughout his life. He had milkshakes every night for the kids, but only Michelle, you and he shared that one. We've heard he was an excellent athlete. He was an all-city and all-state basketball player at North High. His father never missed a game and used to give him advice, which cracked Jack up because he had no idea how basketball worked. <laughs> he went to DU on a full athletic scholarship. And he could have gone to other schools, but he went to DU because he could live at home with his parents and he could save money. And so he graduated from college as a full-time athlete and he graduated with honors in accounting. And his life was forever changed when in 1956, he met a beautiful young woman named Diane Raphael at BMH Congregation during a break at high holiday services. And in many ways, they came from very different worlds. Diane grew up in a sheltered Orthodox Jewish family from Milwaukee. And let's say that Jack was a little more experienced in life. <laughs> and that made Diane nervous. Diane came from a wealthyish, a wealthyish family. And Jack, as we've heard, grew up in a modest environment. The first time he laid eyes on her, he was smitten. And Diane, so are you. But you were much more cautious than Jack. He was persistent, though. You came from such different worlds. You double dated at first with Sandy and Barry Tenenbaum, and he courted you, much to your parents' chagrin, who had no idea who this young man was. And they were very alarmed about this person who was intended on marrying their precious daughter. But we were married on June 23rd, 1957 in the Shoreland Hotel in Chicago, and it was a huge wedding. The honeymoon, of course, in Vegas. What else is new? <laughs> and the first time he came to Chicago, he was amazed after the wedding. He had never seen such tall buildings. Diane's father took him downtown and everybody knew her dad. He was the president of the United Negro College Fund. And they said, hello, sir, how you doing, sir? And then right after the, after the wedding, he left to go into the army. He was a sergeant at Fort Leonard, Missouri. And it was there that he and Donnie Kaufman forged their bond. They were best friends in the army and throughout life. While he was in college, he worked for Dave Cook, selling shoes. And by the time he had graduated, not only did he graduate with honors, with honors but he had saved money. And the goal was to buy into a business. He and Diane had saved some money. And borrowed the little rest from her father, and he paid his father-in-law back in two years. The first of many businesses was Sell Low Discount, originally Star Sales. And he bought into the business with his brother-in-law, Joe Francis, Shirley's husband, who was both a partner and a mentor to Jack. Jack loved Diane passionately. He loved buying her jewelry. She was the love of his life until the day he died just a few days after throwing her a birthday party in Chicago with family and dear friends. They were a team. They were always together, always sharing the joys and sorrows of life. Diane and Jack had a vision for the life they wanted to build together. They wanted not only to be successful, but to give back to the communities that they love so much. Diana Poet wrote the following. Music I heard with you is more than music, and bread I broke with you is more than bread. Now that I am without you, all is desolate. All that was once so beautiful is dead. Your hands once touched this table and this silver, and I have seen your fingers hold this glass. These things do not remember you, beloved, and yet your touch upon them will not pass. For it was in my heart you moved among them, and bless them with your hands and with your eyes. And in my heart, they will all remember always. They knew you once, oh, beautiful and wise. Diane, today you mourn and we mourn with you. Stephen, you were born in 1959. 
Elise in 1960, and then Michelle in 1962. And as a father, he doted, as we've heard so beautifully, on his children. He was a hands-on dad. He was a loving and supportive dad. They loved doing things together, whether it was horseback riding or skiing or going on trips. And when the kids were teenagers, their friends were always included, especially those amazing ski trips. Family togetherness was everything to Jack Zellinger. Road trips to California. He was also a clean freak. And he insisted that their children, that his children and their friends were immaculate. And he had a different and a unique relationship with each of his children. He taught them perseverance, compassion, an incredible work ethic, how to be assertive, aggressive, independent, and most importantly, how to love family. Of course, a key part of the Zellinger family was the time that they were able to spend together in Winter Park. Started off with a condo and then they built that beautiful home where so many wonderful, happy occasions and unfortunately, recently too many very sad things have happened again. He was proud to have been part of the development of Winter Park and that he and the consortium of families purchased land in Winter Park for the Chamber of Commerce building and were huge supporters of that community. He taught his children to see everyone as equal and it was so important that his children live in Denver and go to Denver public schools. He didn't want them surrounded by wealth or privilege. Of course, he loved sports in college. He loved to ski. And he started skiing in his mid-30s. And he became an excellent skier. He raced and won for his age groups. He raised money for disabled skiers and worked hard for the program. He was always exercising. And he was a beloved member of Temple Emmanuel. One of the first decisions that Jack and Diane made was to join Temple. And Diane wasn't so sure about it at first. She grew up Orthodox, but they came around. And Diane, you started best years and Jack loved his Emmanuel community. And he ensured that all of his children received the Jewish education. Jack was not only father to his own children, he became a surrogate father to Joe Johnson, whose mother, Ruth Johnson, was their housekeeper. Diane, there was a time that you were very ill and they moved in with you. And Joe, Joey, as he was known, stayed with you until, you until he graduated from senior high and went into the Navy where he got his medical training. And he was there for every occasion. And Joe, we know you're watching and the family wants you to know how much they love you. And Jack loved being a grandfather. He doted on his grandchildren as we've heard the lessons he taught them. And he loved nothing more than skiing, fishing, eating ice cream together, and giving them advice about their career paths. And one of the greatest losses of his life was this past year, when so many of us were in this same spot, saying farewell to his beloved grandson, Jason. And they were so much alike and they were so close. Jack was Jason's hero, as we've heard so beautifully said by his brother. He was a huge influence on his life. He taught him so many life lessons. Jack had many, many friends. He was very popular and family was so important. But he had so many friends from so many different communities. Wherever he went throughout his life, people were drawn to him. They saw his character, his love, and his love of life in everything he did. And so many of you here today are friends from his childhood that remain strong friends throughout his life. That West Side community, so strong, so vital, so important. There was the poker group, the infamous poker group. From 12 years on throughout their adult lives, they traveled together. They had a pushki that paid for 10 families to join ports of call. And they, tributed, and they contributed every week to charities, b'nai mitzvahs and simchas. But he also forged new friendships. And as we've heard, when he and Diane moved to Arizona six years ago, there was an instant Jewish community and they were so close. They went to every Shabbat service, Kiddush, Oneg. They were close friends. And the Romeo Club, the retired old men eating out. And the poker club, very high stakes, 5, 10, and 25. He says, I don't know if I want to pay for that kind of stakes, he said. Five cents, 10 cents, and 25 cents. They, yeah. they would go fishing in their golf carts. 
and they would Shabbat, they would celebrate Shabbat together. He knew the meaning of tzedakah, and he was so generous to so many causes and institutions, Shalom Park Federation, the Listen Foundation for the Hearing, the Hearing Impaired. He was very involved in the Phoenix Jewish community in the short time that he was there. In Sun Lakes, he was close with beloved Rabbi Wiener. He gave money to help with the Sun Lakes Jewish congregation, a dear friend. He cared deeply about the Winter Park community as well that he helped build. My friends, Jack Zellinger was a strong man. And this was never more evident than during these last few years when he fought illness. And we thought we lost him so many times. But he refused to allow his infirmity to define him or take him away before he was ready. According to Rabbi Yehuda, there were 10 strong things created in the world. Rock is strong, but iron cleaves it. Iron is strong, but fire melts it. Fire is strong, but water quenches it. Water is strong, but clouds bear it away. Clouds are strong, but wind drives them. Winds are strong, but humankind resists them. Humans are strong, but fear casts us down. Fear is strong, but wine casts it out. Wine is strong, but sleep dissolves it. Sleep is strong, but death is stronger. But love is strongest of all, for it survives death. And so for a life that was well lived, we bid shalom to Jack Zellinger. Zichrono Levracha, may his memory be for an eternal blessing and let us all say, Amen. Rabbi Foster, dear friend. Elohim of our God and God of all generations. Thou governest all things with infinite wisdom and mercy, and who guidest the destinies of all of humankind. As a parent, have you loved us and showered your blessings upon us? Therefore, we shall not murmur even when sorrow befalls us, but with humility and unfaltering trust, we shall accept your decrees. In joy and in sorrow alike, we praise your goodness and acknowledge your justice. We remember that we are but strangers upon earth. Like a shadow, our life flees away. Help us, O God, so to walk in your sight, that when the few years of our earthly pilgrimage are ended, we may be ready to meet our end with tranquil mind. To thee we look for comfort and strength. When one of our beloved is taken from us and a link is broken, in the chain of love which binds us together. Though we walk in the valley of the shadow of death, we shall fear no evil, for you are with us. We praise, O eternal our God, in all your dispensations, and sanctified be your name, now and forevermore. And let us all say together, Amen. Dear friends, I know that you have been standing a long time, so I, I want to make a suggestion to you. Turn to your right, just turn to your right and have the, not all the way around and have the person behind you just, just do it, just do it. You'll feel much better, you'll feel much better. Michael, you don't want to do that. Okay. Now turn to the left. Okay, so if somebody didn't get a massage like Mike, somebody give Michael a massage, thank you. Um, I, I do that. No, that's okay. So, so, I, so um, I, I do that for the following reason. Um, first of all, for forgive me just a few more minutes, and I promise it, it won't. Someone just looked at their watch. They wanted you looked at your watch. You wanted to know how long is a minute or two. I want you to know that the other day um, when I met with the family, they had just met with Rabbi Black. And he wrote me and he said, I just finished my two hours with the family. <laughs> so the family sat in my backyard because Joyce wasn't feeling well and I couldn't go to your house. So um, we're sitting in my backyard and I told them that I had just heard from Rabbi Black that you guys spent you know, a good deal of time with him. 
And they said, yeah, we did. And I said, now, whatever you tell me, it can't be the same stuff. <laughs> and they spent two hours with me as well. <laughs> so I, just, I have to laugh a little bit because this is a day of sadness for all of us, knowing full well that we were here not too long ago and Jack was struggling that day. But we also know who he was. And as I'm looking around, there are a lot of smiles. Yes, there are tears. But there are a lot of smiles. It's always hard to come to this time and to this place, especially during these last months. I can't remember a time that we've been in a place like this with so many people. And even if the paper had said it's a private service, you'd all be here anyway, because you all feel some connection, a real connection to Jack. We all had a true and devoted friend in those years that he shared with us. For me, it's been very personal. I have to say something that correct Rabbi Black. I really, and I hate to do this to you, Joe, but I have to do this. Okay. Um, before we even moved here, we were told by my wife's sister, whose husband is Joel, my brother-in-law. Joel and his family lived downstairs and Diane and her family lived upstairs. Now, unless it was a very different neighborhood or Joel was lying to me, you weren't so rich. <laughs> you weren't so rich. It was a modest, nice family. But when they learned that we were going to be here, and it was long before we even met them, they were part of that group that met with us 51 and a half years ago. And we never lost that connection. It's been a wonderful connection. And of course, Jack's sister lived two doors from us. And so we had this wonderful relationship with Jerry, with Doug, and with Sydney, of blessed memory. And so this is, for me, this is a personal day. Because I have to tell you, as most of you, I love Jack Zellinger. He had so many strengths. Yeah, he had a few faults. I don't know what they were. You guys would know what they were. But our purpose in being here today is not just to bring comfort to a family by our presence. And I want you to know that you do bring comfort to a family by your presence. Sometimes people say to me, what should I say to a family? Just be there. Presence makes all the difference in the world. And so by your being here, you do bring comfort to this family. And by being here, hopefully because we'll learn something about how we ought to live. That's what this is about, especially for the grandchildren and that great grandbaby. Where's that great grandbaby? Okay, I heard her, but there she is. Wonderful. Because the grandchildren and the great grandchildren, of which we hope there will be many, have to learn how to become mentioned like Jack was. And it's not an easy task. And he understood that. And he tried his best to make life better for each of you. And so we rob death of its ultimate victory by living life as long as it is ours to live. And that's what he would ask of us, I believe. Jack died as he would have wanted. It wasn't easy. These, how many of you have ever stood on a ladder in the last six years <laughs> and, and your wife or husband said, don't do that. Remember what happened to Jack. We have a little ladder at home, two steps. Joyce says, let one of the kids do it. So she always says, remember what happened to Jack. If we learn something of life because Jack was a part of it, we will have made this day a success for the family because that's what they would like out of this day. But Jack died as he wanted. And we know that these last years have not been easy ones since his fall. Yet he lived those years. He lived those days. 
He was a caring person. He was very, very devoted. Yes, certainly. As a husband, as a dad, as a son. I remember those days. As a brother, I remember those days too. As a grandfather. I remember his parents, at least Ida. And Joyce said to me today, she said, you know, they named the hurricane appropriately because Ida is really angry right now that her Jackie was taken from this earth. But he was devoted to each and every one of the members of that family. He supported their things, whatever they were and didn't ask for accolades for himself. I remember, and Henny, you'll remember as well, all the programs we tried to start. The first one, best years. And it wasn't Jack's doing. It was his contributions, but it was Diane nudging him. Jack, we gotta do this for the next generation. And of course, whatever Diane wanted, Jack provided. And he did it for many, many years. Didn't ask for anything in return. He wanted to make sure that Diane was happy. He was very generous in so many ways. He was honorable in business. He was humble. And he was the kind of person, because, you know, I don't know if you ever think about this, but if you ever see a good painting, a real good painting. The one thing the artist cannot portray is light. He can only portray the shadows of light. And I think in some ways, Jack was the artist. Why? Because he wanted the center of that portrait to be all of these other people. And he covered them. He made sure it happened. He made sure it happened. And he loved being the artist of that portrait of life. He wanted others in the spotlight. He was the kind of person who was confident and gave that confidence to his family. He was proud. I remember years ago, many occasions, being at the pool in your backyard. You have no idea how proud he was of you as kids in that pool, doing whatever it was that you were doing. He was proud. He was a teacher of this family, and especially as we know for Jason. He was a lover and liver of life. Didn't just talk about it, he did it. And his 86 years of life means that our community was a lot better place because he was a part of it. I want to share one other story with you. Jack and Diane went to Israel with us one year. I don't know, it was 82, 84. I, I don't remember. But it was right after there was a, a bombing in the north. And we were staying at a hotel called the North Hotel. And we were having dinner in the dining room. And of course, one side of the dining room was gone. And it was just a tarp there. It was a very nice place, good place. We were not in danger. They had been in danger. We weren't in danger. And when the dinner was through, Diane said, and only you who know Diane can, can understand. Diane said, I think I will have a decaf cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> and Jack tried to get it for her because that's what she wanted. The next morning we left the North Hotel. Jack and Diane were nowhere to be found. They were 10, 15 minutes late. I said to the bus driver, just go around the block. They'll show up. So the bus driver pulled out, went around the block. Jack got on. He was pretty angry with us. He said, what did you expect? I said, well, you know, you were 15, 20 minutes. He said, Diane was buying 12 menorahs, 135 Mrs. Oak. She wants to give all of that stuff to all of her friends and family. He defended her. Jack was a big defender and he was her protector. 
and the protector of every member of this family. He understood what it meant to live each and every day because he knew that his days might, might be shorter than he would have liked. So the other day I was sharing with the family a story that I've shared. Many of you have heard this before, but I want to share it again. My favorite cartoon is Charlie Brown and Snoopy sitting on a pier looking out at the ocean. And Charlie says to Snoopy, Snoopy, one day we're all going to die. And Snoopy says, yeah, Charlie, but on all the other days, we are not. And that was Jack Zellinger. Less than a week ago in Chicago, unveiling birthday party. He was present. And now he's gone. But those were days that he didn't die. Those were days on which he lived. As this service draws to a close, I want to remind all of us, next week is Rosh Hashanah. It's been a whole year since we ended. And at the end of our services on Yom Kippur last year, we said, God, seal us for a year of goodness. Seal, we've been saying all along, Write us in the book of life. But on Yom Kippur afternoon, we say, seal us for a good year. When all is said and done, Jack Zellinger was sealed for 51 weeks out of this year because of the kind of human being that he was, the kind of inspiration that was his, the kind of way in which he tried to make this family and this community better because he was a part of it. I can't think of anything that would be better because I think this is what Jack would have asked me to read, although he never did. It's a little poem called The Messenger, and with this I'll, I'll finish. Messenger, I am closer than ever before. As the morning sun rises and throughout the busy day, I'm with you. Until the setting sun disappears on the horizon, and we watch the day turn into night, I am here. You may feel a faint breeze stir around your head while you slumber as I gently kiss your forehead goodnight. The stars that shine so brightly in my heavenly sky help me watch over you and keep you from harm. I am the wind in the trees and the song of a bird. I am moonbeams in a midnight sky and a glorious rainbow after the storm. I am morning dew and freshly fallen snow. I'm a butterfly flying happy, happily overhead and a puppy happily at play. I'm even somebody who can dunk a basketball. I'm a smile on a stranger's face, a gentle touch, a warm embrace. Listen to the wind for my message of love. Watch the sun rise and set in the sky with me. Feel my essence and circle you with warm memories. Open your heart to know I am not gone. Reach deep into your soul. You will find me. I am here. Have no fear. I am with you always. I do think that's what Jack would want us to know. And that he lived every day of his life. And he was fulfilled in those years. God has given. God has taken away. Praise be the name of God now and forevermore. And let us all say together. Amen. Amen. Amen.